Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. We're going to continue a brand new series that we're starting today titled The Lost Parables of Jesus. Say that with me. Say The Lost Parables of Jesus. Now, if you think we're a crazy church that found some lost parables that are not in the Bible and you've got your purse and your jacket, sit down. That's not what we mean. We're talking about parables where something was lost but then is found. For example, you might have heard the parable of the lost coin. You might have heard of the idea of a lost sheep where God will leave the 99 to pursue the one. That is the idea of the series on the lost parables. We in Luke chapter 15. And as we journey through these stories, I want to give an encouragement that these stories are not like dead words on a page. But when you listen to them closely, you'll begin to realize that even though Jesus told these stories 2,000 years ago, and some of the examples that he uses might be different than what we use today, that the principles within the story still greatly benefit us in our lives today. Before we jump into the passage, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to hear your word. Lord, I thank you that your word has the power to transform, to set free, and to help us to understand your will for our lives. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start with a question today. Does anybody here, you love to hike? You're like, I love to be outside and hike. Does anybody here love to hike for the first five minutes of the hike? And you walk and the second that you take that extra inhale, you're like, that was good. Let's head back. Got my steps in for the day, right? And as with every hike, you know it's always going to start out feeling great. Yesterday as a part of the young adult group here at the church, we had an opportunity to go on a hike. And the hike was amazing especially in the parking lot before it started <laughs> because you're just hanging out with your friends, you're just chatting, playing games, no, no physical turmoil going on, no soreness in the legs, no in the back of your mind, are we there yet? So we're on this hike and we're going to base this hike off the story of Joseph in the Bible. Last week, Pastor Mike shared a sermon about Joseph and it just happened that we planned this hike around the story of Joseph. And we were studying the story of Joseph. So before we started walking, we gave a little overview of what is going on in his story. And that part was great. But now we have to start walking. So we go to the base of this mountain. I'm saying mountain like it's dramatic. It felt like that for me, okay? Leave me alone. And we start to walk up. And the way that this hike is designed is there's a piece of paper that I have to read on as we're going. So we're walking. And I'm reading the paper, and it's fine. And then there's a little break where I'm supposed to read the next question. And then I'm like, so what do you guys think of? And I'm finally like, all right, y'all need to slow down. <laughs> like something you need to understand about me is that my breathing, I'm built more like a French bulldog than a human. <laughs> they got that, that smushed in face. Like it's 73 degrees, and a French bulldog is like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's how I'm built. So, like, if you're going to be what's called, they label themselves as, I'm a pace setter. No, you're taking away my oxygen capacity. That's what you is doing. We're talking about uh, this story and going through how I'm getting a little bit tired. And then we begin to sort of let our walls down. We begin to tell stories and share kind of what God is doing in our lives. And as we're going on in this hike where we're talking about the story of Joseph, we're realizing in our group there's a few themes that keep popping up. And one of the themes that kind of sums up everything that was happening on that hike was that each of us probably found ourselves in a moment where things were difficult. Where each of us thought in that difficult moment that we did something to get ourselves out of that situation. And then looking back and talking through the story of Joseph, we realized that it wasn't that we were so good as to get ourselves out of that situation. But in fact, that God by his grace had picked us up 
in the palm of his hand and he carried us out. That it wasn't the fact that we had found God in this moment and then we were set free. It's that God had found us. And because God has found us, he helped us to find freedom in a situation that we would still be stuck in if it wasn't for his grace. And just like we saw in the story of Joseph last week and as we saw on that hike, that at the end of the day, it was never our ability or it was never Joseph's ability that got him into the palace, that got him to where God had him to be, called him to be. Yes, Joseph was faithful. And yes, he tried his best to do what was right. But at the end of the day, apart from God's grace and God's goodness, Joseph would have never arrived where he needed to be. It was God who found Joseph and brought him on this journey called life. And as we journey into the scriptures today and look at the lost parables, we're going to see how over and over and over again, how it is not the fact that we are finding God, but the truth of the matter is that God is finding us. The first lost parable that I want to look at today is the parable of the lost sheep. Now, by a show of hands, who here in this room is ever like you came home from work and you lost a sheep? We got two, maybe a third farmer in the room that I didn't see. Now, I want to ask another question. Who here has ever lost something that you valued? Raise your hand now. A lot more hands. So as we're reading through this story and I say something like the lost sheep, don't turn off your brain because you're like, well, I'm not a farmer, so this means nothing to me. See the principle within the story. If you've lost something that was valuable to you and you looked for it, this story 100%, you understand it. And the first example of this story is found in Matthew chapter 18, where the disciples are asking Jesus, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says to summarize it, because I don't want to read through the whole story, is that the first who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is one who is like a child. And some of you heard me say that and you're like, well, not my child. My child might be in last place if they make it into the kingdom. Going crazy over not getting Starbucks. The idea of a child is not that it's how they're acting when they're misbehaving. That's not what Jesus is getting at. What Jesus is getting at is that a child has to rely on their parents to be alive. A child has to rely on their father for sustenance. A child has to rely on someone that's greater than them to help them through life. It's like a video I saw on Facebook this past week, and maybe you've seen one like it too, where a little kid is three or four years old, and they've had enough, and they're running away from home. And I saw this video this past week where this little girl, she was in snow boots, shorts, a tank top, and she had snacks in her book bag and her toys in her other hand. And she's like, I'm leaving. And the mom's like, Zariah, what's wrong? She's like, I'm leaving home. I'm leaving. And she's like, Zariah, why are you so upset? Why are you leaving home? She's like, because. She's like, why are you upset? She's like, you told me to clean my room. And she's like, Zariah, well, the door is always open, but if you want to leave, you can go ahead and leave. And she's like, fine, I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I'm serious, I'm leaving this time. And that little girl, you know why she kept turning around? Because every single step she took towards that door, she realized she was about to walk into a world she knew nothing about. She was going to walk into a world where the only way she could ever navigate that world is if she has parents who are bringing her through it. That little girl made it down half the steps. She looks around, she goes, <laughs> right back into the house. So the same way that a child relies on their father or their mother for their existence, we see that Jesus models a life where every time he's doing something, he's always pointing back to his heavenly, his father. So the greatest in the kingdom is those who rely on the father. 
And then in speaking to his disciples, those who would eventually build this church, he says, the greatest is the one who doesn't cause the little ones to stumble. And then finally he gets to this parable of the wandering sheep. Matthew chapter 18 verse 10 says this. He says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. Verse 12, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go and look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than the 99 that didn't wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now what I love about this story is that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And based off of his target audience, Jesus is going to change how he speaks and how he uses examples. So in this first example, when speaking to those who would eventually almost take the reins and begin to build the kingdom of God and go out into all the world with the gospel, when they ask, how can I be the greatest in heaven, Jesus does not say to them, you have to pray. He does not say to them, the greatest is the one who is fasting. He does not say the greatest is the one who is studying or singing and all those things are good things. He says that the greatest is the one who relies on God. Now what did Jesus always do? He relied on his heavenly, his heavenly father, right? He then says that the greatest is the one who doesn't cause the little ones to stumble. We see that Jesus would not lead people astray. He always led them back to the father. And then he says that the greatest is the one who's going after the lost sheep. And all of these things that Jesus said in this story are actually the purpose of the disciples on this earth. That they were to go out into the earth and now be imitators of what Jesus did when he was on the earth. So we see that in the kingdom, that greatness is not measured by how often you can check off the boxes of, all right, I prayed, I read my Bible, I fasted, I'm done. God, I'll see you tomorrow when I read my Bible. That greatness is measured by how do we relate to and love to those who are around us. Every example that Jesus gave when he's asked who's the greatest, every one of those examples had to do with some sort of relationship. Whether it's relying on God or helping those who are around you. And we see in this first story that as Jesus is talking about um, these parables with his disciples, that it has that target audience. But watch what happens when we read the same story. And when I say the same story, I'm talking about a parable, but not the same circumstance. Read the same idea of the lost sheep through this different understanding, through this different context. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So I'm like, I can see you welcoming sinners, but eating with them? No, that's too far, Jesus. That's too far. You're breaking bread with a tax collector, with a sinner. So we have a very diverse audience here. We have on the one side, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And on the other side, we have the sinners and the IRS. And these Pharisees, when they see Jesus sitting down to have dinner with the IRS, they're like, I cannot believe that Jesus is breaking bread, is listening to these sinners and talking to these tax collectors. Now, when it comes to our modern day idea, when we think of the IRS, that would be the closest thing to our mind to a tax collector in the Bible. But believe it or not, the picture of a tax collector in the Bible is much worse than the IRS. It's way worse than the IRS. If, if we told them what we have today, they'd be like, I want to time travel. I want to live under that sort of thing. Here is the biblical picture of a tax collector. Imagine that it's your daughter's second birthday. And you tell your daughter on her second birthday, when you turn five, we're going to Disney World. Your daughter's be like, ah, 
We're going to see Mickey Mouse, uh uh-huh. We're going to see Minnie Mouse, uh uh-huh. And when you turn five, we're going to Disney. So your daughter turns three and you tell her two more years and we're going to Disney. And she's growing in excitement and then she turns four, all right, one more year. We're going to Disney and your daughter's just about bursting at the seams and she turns five. And it's like, guess whose birthday it is? You know, kids, (laughs) me. They get that excitement, right? And you do all the math and you say, okay, this Disney trip was $3,000. I've got $3,000 in my savings. And I do the math for my taxes this year and it costs $1,500. So you say, all right, I've got $3,000 in my Chase account. I've got $1,500 because TurboTax told me this is how much money I need. And then a tax collector comes to your door. And they say, hi, are you Mr. Smith? And I say, yes. They're like, okay, we're here to collect your taxes. And I go, perfect. And I go and I print out my turbo tax and I say, all right, here's how much I earned. Here's how much was deducted. So here's the 1500 that I owe you. But the tax collector knows that I've got 3000 in my Chase account. And the tax collector says, uh, no, sir, your bill is actually 4500 this year. And you know that 3000 is for your daughter's fifth birthday. Like, I've been talking about this for three years. And the tax collector says, no, sir, you owe, you owe $4,500. He say, no, it's $1,500. And here's what a tax collector of the biblical days would say. They say, sir, you owe $4,500. If you want to evade taxes, I'm going to have to have you arrested by a soldier. And then we're going to seize your assets. And your family's going to lose the sole breadwinner. Is that what you want for your family? And the people, they would have to pay the agent, all the money they had because the IRS agent wants to put the money in their own pocket. Imagine that you had to tell your daughter, we're not going to Disney, and then you see that the tax collector that stole your money is on a vacation with their family. That is the understanding of a biblical tax collector. So that's one side. They would steal. They did not care about people's well-being or lives. They got whatever they wanted. And then we have the Pharisees on the other hand. The Pharisees were obsessed with the idea that if they can remove all sin from their lives and remove all the sin from other people's lives, that the Messiah would show up and set them free from the bondage they lived under. They'd be set set free from the Romans. So not only did the Pharisees like do things like tithing on the mint leaves that they had, and trying to do every single thing perfect, they began to make up rules for other people to try to keep them away from sin. They said, you know what, here's what God says, we're going to add on rules in front of what God said so that people can't get to even close to sin. So imagine hypothetically that God creates a rule that nobody can get pricked by a porcupine. If you get pricked by a porcupine, it's a sin. So the teachers of the law would get up and they would say, Here's the message from God. God says, if any of you are within 10 feet of a porcupine, that you're going to be cut off. Imagine another way that God says, you cannot break a bone. And this is all hypothetical. They would say, all right, here's a message from God. Anyone that is caught playing contact sports or going on a playground or going skydiving is going to be cut off. And the Pharisees were so obsessed with trying to do the right thing and trying to be right that they would make rules and regulations for everyone. And then on the flip side, we have tax collectors who don't care about any of those things. They're all about me, 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 and they're going to steal your hard-earned money. Now listen to the start of this passage again with that understanding of the tax collector versus the Pharisee. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Can you imagine the tension of going into church and three rows down is the person that stole your daughter's money and went on a vacation with it? How would you feel? So there's that tension there. Yeah, everyone's like, I can't even say it. We in church. (laughs) There's that tension there when Jesus is speaking to this diverse audience. 
that on one hand, there's those who are obsessed with making rules for others. And on the other side, there's those who don't care about the rules. They'll make up their own rules as long as it benefits them. And Jesus speaks to them in a story. In Luke chapter 15, verse 3, it says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And then he goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together. And he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now remember here, Jesus is telling this parable to an audience of tax collectors, sinners, and Pharisees. He paints this picture for them that there's a hundred sheep, but then one of them goes missing. And the, the shepherd is taking account for the sheep. And the shepherd goes 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. Hi, Carla, baby. 98, 99. Where's Jeffrey? Jeffrey, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey. And the shepherd's like, oh my goodness, I lost Jeffrey. And Jesus says that in order to find Jeffrey, that the shepherd will leave those in the open country, the 99. And now he's going to go after Jeffrey until he finds him. Now understand something about this story. It's not saying that Jesus left the 99 to be eaten by ravenous wolves. The 99 were where they needed to be. The 99 sheep were where the shepherd wanted them to be. There's this one sheep, Jeffrey, and Jeffrey's not in the Bible, so please don't leave a review. Hey, uh, they're adding Jeffrey to the Bible. <laughs> you see that the sheep is located outside the pasture. And I want to ask this question. When we look at this story, how does the shepherd recover the lost sheep? Does it say that he prayed, God in heaven, you know where Jeffrey is. I almost ate this boy for dinner last week and I wish I did. Would you return Jeffrey, please? Is that what it says? No. Does it say, Jeffrey, I'm already in my pajamas, so we're not doing that. Let me go into the Pine Bush Yard Sale group and be like, hey, has anyone seen Jeffrey? No. Does it say that he went and stapled up flyers looking for Jeffrey lost sheep? No. Does it say that the shepherd went and pursued the lost sheep? Yes. You see, this is the example of the love that Jesus Christ has for humanity. That Jesus is not just sitting back passively saying, well, I hope humanity turns back to me one day. But in fact, he steps into creation as fully God and fully man. And in an act of love, he pursues you and he pursues me. You see, the biblical definition of love is not a feeling. Because if love is rooted in a feeling and the feeling goes away, you no longer have love. Imagine trying to build a relationship on the feeling of love. If the feeling of love is the foundation of the relationship... What happens when the feeling is gone? You have no foundation. But we see in the Bible that love is not a feeling but an action. The Bible says, for, it doesn't say for God so loved the world that he, he felt like he loved us. It says for God so loved the world that he gave. Love is not a feeling, it is an action. And in this parable of the lost sheep, we see the love of God on display. That even if there's a 99 safe, you say, well, a 99, that's still an A+. Plus. Jesus says, but there's one more. And I am going after the one. This is the love that Jesus has for his people. And this is actually a lot of the tension that Jesus lived through, even in this story. Almost as like, who is worthy of love? How much do we have to do before we can deserve to be loved? But watch what Jesus says in the next part of the story. I tell you in the same way that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, over one sinner 
over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who don't need to repent. Now, imagine this, that I was preaching to an audience of pastors and construction workers. And I'm preaching a message about going after someone who's lost. And I finally go and I find this person who's lost. And I end my sermon by saying, and all of heaven rejoices over one construction worker. Over one construction worker. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. When we look at this story, it says that Jesus was talking to the tax collectors, the Pharisees, and the... The sinners. So when he says at the end of his sermon, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, it's like me saying one construction worker. This sermon is an example of God's love, but it's also an invitation to the sinner to come home. So now imagine you're upset at the person who stole your Mickey Mouse money. And then Jesus says all of heaven rejoices over one thief who repents and turns back and is like, oh, shoot. All of heaven is rejoicing at the fact that the person that hurt me is turning back to God. That is the tension of the story. That is the tension of God's grace. So Jesus tells this story that illustrates his love, but it's also an invitation to come home to God. We see that Jesus is not just here for people who are righteous. Those who are righteous don't need saving. But he's also here for the sinner. And the first point that I want to make as we look at this story and apply it to our lives today is number one, don't push away the people that Jesus is calling. Don't push away those who Jesus is calling. It's very easy for us to realize that Jesus died for sinners. That's easy. I was a sinner too at one time, right? That's easy to know. Now imagine, think about the person that has hurt you the most in your life. Think about that turmoil that you felt when they said what they said or they did what they did. Now imagine Jesus saying, all of heaven rejoices when that person turns back to me. Now it's like, ooh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. I get that Jesus died for the world, but for them? You don't see how they hurt me? All right, this didn't get any amens first service either, because now it's personal. Now it's personal. I love that Jesus died for the world, but for them? You know what they did to me? And what I love about Jesus is that we don't have to ask what would Jesus do because it's written down in Scripture. Because now imagine for a second that the person who hurt you the most, they nail you to a cross. And they're there and they're laughing at you while you're hanging on a cross. And Jesus opens up his mouth and you're like, oh, he's about to curse me out, isn't he? And the words that Jesus says is he looks at you and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is the love of Jesus. The tension is that Jesus died for the tax collector that stole your vacation money. Matthew 9, chapter 9, verse 13 says that as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew, everybody say Matthew, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Where was he sitting? Oh, so then Jesus can't use him, right? He steals Mickey Mouse money. Perfect. Jesus is going to say, Matthew, depart from me, worker of iniquity, right? Wait, hold on. In my Bible, it says, he says to Matthew, follow me. Wait, but Jesus, there are people who are too far gone to follow you, right? You, if anything, we're too, I'm too far gone. (laughs) That's the gospel message. We're all too far gone. So because we're too far... The shepherd comes to the sheep and he says, follow me. He says, follow me. And he told, Ma- he told him, and Matthew got up and he follows him. And then in the next part of this passage, Jesus says, because the Pharisees again are like, why is he with these tax collectors? 
he says, understand this, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, you can follow the rules of the sacrifice, but the whole point of this story is how are we taking care of those who are around us. The mercy is better than the sacrifice. Today we have a book of the Bible known as Matthew because Jesus was willing to reach out to a tax collector. So if you've ever been hurt by someone and you feel like they're too far gone to be used by God, open up your Bible just to the title of the book of Matthew and realize that every word written in the book of Matthew was written by a tax collector that came into contact with the love of Jesus. That is the reality of it. Number two, pursue the one. Say that with me. Say pursue the one. We see in the first story in the book of Matthew that there is this shepherd going after the sheep. And we understand that that really is what we call evangelism. Like sharing the good news to those who are lost. The reason why the disciples were, like, if you look at their stories, they actually died some pretty horrible deaths, but they did not waver one inch. The reason why they were so firm in their faith is because they knew what Jesus had done in their life. They had seen their, their king who was dead rise back, up to their, rise back up to life. And because they had a story of how God had impacted them, they, to their dying breath, shared that story. Even Peter, when he's being crucified, his last, you know what his last words are? Do not crucify me right side up. Please crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die in the way that my Lord did. That's the level of dedication that he had for Jesus. Not because of Peter was so strong, but because he had a story of how Jesus impacted his life. Your story is your greatest weapon for reaching others for Jesus. Your story is your greatest weapon for reaching others for Jesus. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 through 6 says this. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned. Everybody say seasoned. With salt. So that you may know how to answer each person. Have you ever had an unseasoned chicken breast before? You go to someone's house and they're like, I'm making my secret recipe. And you're just sitting in the kitchen and they go to season the chicken and they got eight pieces of chicken and they're like, where's my secret seasoning? Oh, there it is. And they get the salt off the table and they just, whoo, caliente. Whew. Sorry if it's spicy, I use salt. And you eat that chicken and they're just staring at you like, how is it? And you're like, mmm, I can taste the water you boiled it in. Mmm. This is so delicious. Now let me ask you, was there anything wrong with the chicken when it was bought from the supermarket? No. The problem is the person delivering the chicken, I'm not going to say it's a sin, but like <laughs> right on that edge. They didn't season the chicken. So because they didn't season the chicken, you don't want to eat it, right? The gospel message is like a chicken breast. It's perfect the way that it is. You bring it. But if you don't season it and you're nasty and you're rude and you're judgmental when you say, hey, try Jesus. And people are like, I see the attitude you have. I see how you slay our supervisor once they turn their back. Why would I want to eat this gospel message? You're rude. You're mean. That person doesn't have Jesus and they're a lot nicer than you, right? It's like an unseasoned piece of chicken. But sometimes you go to a restaurant and you take a bite and you go, oh, ho, ho, ho. and you look at whoever you're with and you share that moment, right? That is the gospel message when you give it graciously. It is something better than what you can ever experience. That is the good news. And once you get a bite of it, it's like, oh, you got to try this. Try that. Try that. Try that. Hey, can I get the chef? 
Hey, let me introduce you to the chef. Let me introduce you to my friend Jesus, right? That is the nature of the message. I'm not even hungry. I ate, but we're going to talk about food today. So how do we apply this message to our lives? Maybe today you feel like the shepherd, like there's someone you're trying to share Jesus with and they're just not getting it. Don't quit on them. Keep trying. Keep talking to them with a seasoned with salt message. Keep encouraging them. Maybe you feel like the Pharisee today, like you see that God is reaching out to someone who hurt you. Remember, you're safe, that God's got you too. God's helping them, but he's also helping you in those moments, right? And maybe you feel like you're the lost sheep, like you're not connected to Jesus, like you've never made a decision to follow him. I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to him today. And we do this by praying a prayer. We can all say it together. Say it with me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.